Whether you're a musician, podcaster, or video maker, we gotta talk microphones. Hey, how's it going everyone? I'm Jeremy, and yeah, I think we need to talk about microphones. It's one of the many tools in our arsenal that we need to understand because probably one day, you're gonna need to buy one. And there's so many different types out there, and it's not just about the size and shape, although size certainly does matter, and we'll get to that later. Um, but we should probably talk about the different kinds of microphones first. Some of the most prevalent mics out there are called dynamic microphones. Dynamic microphones use magnets to pick up sound. This is called magnetic induction, and since they use magnets, they usually have a size limitation, as in they can only be so small. These mics can be pretty cheap and they're usually pretty robust. One of the more common microphones that you've probably seen everywhere is called the Shure SM58. This has been used as a live stage vocal microphone for decades. They are reliable and they can probably survive a nuclear blast. They're really robust. Something that should be understood with dynamic mics is that they're not sensitive, meaning you won't really pick up quiet sounds. Of course, this can be achieved in a perfect environment, but it's really not what they're designed to do. Uh, being that they're not very sensitive, they make great vocal microphones for live situations because they won't create feedback. They pretty much only pick up sound from what is directly in front of them, unless it's a really loud sound source. The next microphone is called a condenser microphone. These mics use an electrical charge to pick up sound. They're generally really sensitive mics that are used mostly in studio in a controlled environment, but you'll still see them in live stages too. Condenser mics come in a variety of sizes, and a lot of times they're quite small, um, often called pencil mics or small diaphragm condensers. And some are quite large, and they're called large diaphragm condensers. Small diaphragm condensers are usually used to pick up instruments and large diaphragm condensers are usually reserved in studio vocal performances, although that can change too. Small diaphragms are really transparent and can accurately capture whatever sound it's pointed at. Uh, let me just remind you to subscribe to the channel uh, so we can talk like this more, but let's get back into mics. Large diaphragm mics are almost an instrument in it of themselves where the mic will add certain characteristics to a vocal performance. You can think of them as adding flavor to the sound. Different mics will color the way your voice sounds and we aren't even getting into preamps. This video would be like a 20 minute long video on just preamps. But as talking about mics, uh, certain mics will color your sound and other mics are just more transparent. Both large and small diaphragm condenser mics will need something called 48 volt phantom power. This can be supplied by an audio interface or a mixer. You need 48 volt phantom power to be engaged or the mic won't work. Um, it took me too long to figure that one out. The phantom power is basically what allows these microphones to be sensitive, that electrical charge. The third type of microphone is called a ribbon microphone. A ribbon mic uses a thin piece of metal that vibrates, which is called a ribbon, to pick up the sound. The old rule of thumb is that you never add 48 volts phantom power to these mics. The phantom power will burn up the material that the ribbon was made of. So, sucks if you put phantom power on a ribbon. I think modern day ribbon mics are a little bit more robust. Um, definitely check the user manual before adding a 48 volts to a ribbon mic. The mic won't need phantom power, but the question is, will phantom power destroy your mic? So, <laughs> just, just be careful there if you decide to get a ribbon mic. When talking about mics, something you might have heard is polar patterns. Polar pattern defines how much of the signal will be picked up by the mic in different directions. Some microphones capture sound from everywhere, and this would be called an omnidirectional polar pattern. Other mics capture sound from more of like a heart-shaped pattern directly in front of the mic, and this would be called a cardioid polar pattern. We can even subdivide the cardioid polar pattern into even more shapes, such as supercardioid, hypercardioid, and shotgun. Um, all of those types of cardioids basically can pick up sound from the rear of the microphone as well. So it sort of has this heart-shaped 
polar pattern, but then like a little dip below because it will, it won't just reject sound from the rear. It'll actually pick up sound from the rear. So definitely something to note. They all have different uses too. Some are better for music and others are better for video production. The mic I'm currently using is called a shotgun mic. It has an extremely tight polar pattern and it basically means that like if I get out of the way of the mic just a little bit, it won't pick up the sound as well as when I'm directly under it. So basically I need to be directly in front of this mic for it to make me sound good. Another common video production mic is called a lavalier. Lavalier can sometimes be hidden under the clothes, but I see a lot of people nowadays, or at least in the YouTube world, just clip them right outside the clothing. If you've ever seen late night talk shows, basically the host always has one, or a lot of the times two lavaliers clipped right onto their shirt or a tie. Uh, they usually use two for redundant purposes, so if one goes down, they have the other one as a backup. Another important technical feature of a microphone is the frequency response. Sound is made up of frequencies, which is basically a measurement of how fast the sound wave vibrates through air. So to simplify it, think of like a piano and all the piano keys. The keys all the way on the left are low frequencies. So your left, low frequencies. And the keys all the way on the right are high frequencies. And everything in between is basically just somewhere in the middle. Anyway, all mics have a frequency response. Some mics are more sensitive to certain frequencies than others, meaning that when they pick up sound from those frequencies, they will relatively sound louder than other frequencies. So our human voice is made up of many frequencies, but the frequencies that are sort of most pronounced to us are around 1,000 and 4,000 hertz. Well, some mics are very sensitive around those frequencies, so it might accentuate our voice. Some mics have a flat frequency response as well, and they're usually reserved as a diagnostic tool. If you need to tune a live room, you might want to have a microphone with a very flat frequency response so it can accurately capture all of the frequencies in the room as accurately as possible. Acousticians will use these measurements to notch out overabundant frequencies through a soundboard or through like some other external piece of equipment that can shape the sound of a room. I know sometimes very boxy rooms can have a lot of bass response. Well, you sort of want that mic to pick up all of the frequencies that are bouncing around in that room so you can notch out maybe bass or maybe, you know, something over 10K. So there's lots of different things that you can use one of those type of microphones for. That pretty much covers the basics of mics, but there's also a boatload of accessories that are essential for some mics. A common accessory that's pretty important is a pop filter or a windscreen. They serve the same purpose pretty much, but they look a little bit different from each other. A windscreen is usually a foam covering that covers the capsule of the mic. This prevents too much air from getting into the mic, which results in something called a plosive. A plosive can sound like a pop or a rustling sound through the mic. Um, a pop filter is similar, but it takes the shape of a screen that is placed in front of the microphone. This is usually reserved for vocal microphones and for people singing into them. It's common to see a pop filter in front of a large diaphragm condenser mic so that you don't spit or puff air into the diaphragm of the mic. Another popular accessory is a shock mount. Sometimes when you mount a microphone directly onto a stand, little vibrations from the floor or stand can shake the microphone just enough to produce a little bit of noise or rumble. A shock mount suspends the microphone from some type of elastic so that vibrations dissipate before they get into the actual microphone themselves. You will see this a lot in studio setting or large diaphragm condenser mics. Studios are all about control and eliminating as many variables as possible to get the cleanest and best sound, so you usually see them there. Also, if you are into movie making, you might have heard of a boom guy. I was a boom guy for a little bit. A boom guy holds a shotgun mic over the talent so that audio can be recorded separately from the video. Well, that shotgun mic is usually suspended in a shock mount, which makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Any slight movement from like the boom guy holding the boom can introduce vibrations into the microphone and a shock mount is pretty much crucial in that instance, especially after a long day and his or her arms are getting crazy tired. 
Anyway, learning microphones can certainly be a deep dive, but I think it's sort of fun to learn about this stuff. Check out some other YouTube videos that sort of just focus on what you need. Do you need a mic for an instrument? Do you need a vocal mic? Um, will you use it live? Is this mic gonna be used in video production, etc.? And this will sort of help you narrow down your choices. So hey, thanks for checking out this video and give it a thumbs up. That really helps push it to more people. Uh, subscribe if you're new, but with that being said, I'll see you in the next video. Bye.